Professor Johnson, how does a lawyer's perspective help in evaluating scientific theories? And aren't you a bit out of your element? Well, if I'm out of my element, then uh, Charles Darwin must also have been out of his element because his uh, training was in uh, medicine and uh, theology, although he was, in fact, a very good scientist, uh, self-taught, a gentleman amateur like others of his time. Charles Lyell, the father of modern geology, was a lawyer. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the thing about Darwinian evolution today is that it is a general philosophical concept that connects many disparate fields of science so that you see uh, molecular biologists, for example, are relying on fossil experts, paleontologists, and vice versa. And then they're all relying on geneticists. And each one of these groups of scientists outside their own element is just a generalist, is just a, a layman like, like anyone else. Uh, so there aren't really any specialists in evolution. It's a generalist's country. What a lawyer brings to this, or an academic lawyer who is uh, philosophically oriented, is a nose for the, the assumptions, the patterns of thinking, the things that, as members of a particular professional culture, the, the people just take for granted and never question. Uh, for example, one of those things is the creative power of natural selection. If you ask these people, how do you know that mutation and selection, the Darwinian mechanisms, have the power to create complex organs, the answer will, they give will be some variation on, well, everybody knows that. That's common knowledge. We settled that long ago. All of these things that say, we've just decided not to think about that, but simply to assume it. So th that's what a lawyer brings to this, is the ability to recognize things like that and bring them out in the open. And that's, of course, why the outsider is so unpopular with the insiders. Because the outsider is saying, look, uh, here's where you went wrong. This is the assumption you made that was never established, and that because you couldn't establish it, you agreed to treat it as a fact among yourselves, and then to use your authority to prevent anybody from criticizing it. Well, naturally, the professional group doesn't want to hear that. And so they hate outsiders, uh, as uh, they properly should, I, I suppose, because they, they blow the whistle on this. Um, the other thing to be said about the outsider uh, is that every one of the great authorities of Darwinism, from Charles Darwin and T.H. Huxley at the beginning, through Dobzhansky, Simpson, and Julian Huxley a generation ago to Stephen Jay Gould and Richard Dawkins and so on today, uh, is that every one of those authorities wrote books for the general public. They addressed the general public. And not a single one of them ever said, this evidence is inaccessible to you. Don't try to figure it out because you can't understand it. Indeed, the implied premise of all the books was, it's easily understood. And anyone who isn't completely prejudiced or ignorant can see that it's obviously true. So I like to think of myself as the reader for whom all those books were intended. And I'm speaking back to the authors and explaining to them what they overlooked. That in fact, their books are not convincing because they're assuming at the beginning of the inquiry the point that they claim to have demonstrated at the end. And so there's a thinking flaw. Um, so instead of responding to that, naturally they say, oh, why don't you shut up um, and leave us alone uh, so we can continue to get away with this.